Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. We're excited that you're in, uh, joining Danielle and Scott and I today for the lesson about the veils. Today we're going to spend a lot of time looking at uh, Jesus' work through the veil. And we'll see him moving around in different parts of the, the sanctuary as we go through this. So let your presence be felt with us here today as we study the lesson together. We have got such a beautiful and meaningful lesson in the book of Hebrews. Lord, we ask that uh, you open our minds, open our hearts, and that you send your Holy Spirit to guide and direct our studies so that we could hear your words loud and clear and derive the meaning that you have for us to understand. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your word and for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So our memory verse comes to us from Hebrews 9.24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God before us. So we see Christ in the, in the different holy places within the sanctuary in heaven. And one of the fundamental beliefs of the Adventist church is that of the sanctuary and the tabernacle that is in heaven and what God's doing in, in heaven. The, the um, belief begins with there is a sanctuary in heaven, the true tab tabernacle which the Lord set up and not man. In it, Christ ministers on our behalf, making available to the believers the benefits of his atoning sacrifice offered once and for all on the cross. He is inaugurated as our high priest and began his intercessory ministry at the time of his ascension. In 1844, at the end of the prophetic period of the 2300 days, he entered the second and last phase of his anointing ministry. It was the work of the investigative judgment, which is part of the ultimate disposition of all sin, typified by the cleansing of the ancient Hebrew sanctuary on the day of the atonement. So we see that at different times, Christ's ministry, there were different aspects to Christ's ministry, and we're, we're going to get into that in more depth and more detail as we look at actually the sanctuary here on earth and the veils and how different, uh, there were different aspects of the service uh, in, in those areas behind the veils. And we'll see early in Revelation, uh, uh, Revelation 1, 12 to 13, we see Christ working in the holy place. It says, And then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me. This is John. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, Jesus walking among the candlesticks. And so we see Jesus working in the candlesticks, working in the seven churches, and then, moving later in Revelation, um, which is 11, 18, and 19, there's a time when the, Asian, the nations are angry, and we see that. And your wrath has come, and at that time the dead, that they should be judged, that you should reward your servants and prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and shall destroy those on the earth. Then the temple was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, earthquake, and great hail. So we see Christ now working in the, in the most holy place of the temple later in Revelation. So the, the, the important piece is that Christ is working in our behalf no matter what area of the sanctuary he's in. And... The work that he's doing in our behalf is so amazing because he's bringing us home and he is saving us to the uttermost. And, and that is really the, the key piece of, of this whole, whole lesson. But let's back up a little bit to the key that really started this. 
、um, is when the、uh, disciples returned to the Mount of Olives right after Jesus ascended to heaven. They were filled with joy and triumph. Their master and friend had ascended to a position of power over the world, and had invited them to approach God in His name with absolute confidence that God would respond favor- favorably to their prayers. They understood now the sacrifice that Christ had done. So in John 14:13 through 14, we see, "And whatever you ask in my name, I will do, that my Father be glorified in the Son." If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Even though they continued in the world attacked by the forces of evil, their hope is strong. They knew that Jesus had ascended to prepare a place for them, and we see him say that in John fourteen one through three. In my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. And so, when he goes to prepare this place, the next promise is: once I go. I will come again and take you home to me, and so we see that in verse three. They knew that Jesus was their captain of their salvation, and that he had opened the way into the heavenly home, homeland through his blood. The ascension of Jesus to heaven is a central theology in Hebrews, along with the work that he's doing in the sanctuary. It marks the beginning of his rule and the beginning of his priestly ministry in our behalf. And more important, Jesus' ascension marks the moment that the new covenant which provides the means through which we can approach God boldly through faith. Faith has been inaugurated. It is our privilege now to approach God with confidence through Jesus and the merits of His righteousness. So it's it's so exciting to study this to realize that. We are Christ's. His whole focus. We are His whole focus, from the time He came to save us, after we'd sinned, His ascension, and now in heaven He's still working on our behalf, on a regular basis. I wanted to read you something from Stephen Nelson, Stephen Nelson Haskell that he wrote. That is is so beautiful. It kind of ties this up a little bit. In the Epistle of Hebrews, shows the leading apostle clearly taught the anatypical fulfillment of types and shadows celebrated for so many years. It should not be forgotten that the gift of the Spirit of prophecy and the Sabbath of the Lord were always connected to the, with the sanctuary service. We have no reason to doubt that during the history of the Christian Church, the subject of the sanctuary and anatypical work of Christ in heaven were clearly understood by Christians. But when the Bible was taken from them, when the Sabbath was hidden, and the voice of the Spirit of prophecy was no longer heard directing the church, then they lost sight of this beautiful anatypical work represented in the ancient sanctuary service. But the time arrived for the opening of the great judgment in heaven, when the Father and the Son, with their retinue of holy angels, passed in state into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. No earthly pageant could ever compare with this majestic cortege. God designed that it would be recognized on earth. He caused a message to be proclaimed to the inhabitants of earth, directing their attention to the movements of the Son of God. This, known as the first angel's message, and we see that,、um, and we all remember what the first angel's message is. To, to preach God's word, a large company accepted the message, and their attention was centered on the Savior. But they did not understand the anatypical work in the sanctuary, and hence they expected the Savior to come to earth. Instead of coming to earth, however, he went into the second apartment of the sanctuary to take up the work of judgment. So,、um, as we go on through today's lesson. We're going to look more at this work that Jesus has been doing in heaven. So, Danielle, talk to us about Jesus before the Father. Sunday's lesson, Jesus before the Father, is we are looking starting with Hebrews nine twenty four, and we are unpacking that.、Um, so, let's look together at Hebrews chapter nine, verse twenty four. 
For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. It's a short little verse. But there is quite a lot that we're going to unpack and we're going to look, what I like about this quarter study and particularly my Sunday that was given to me, is how we are looking back at the past and what was being done with the Israelites and how the Israelites were taught and us through them and then how Jesus fulfilled. So in the past, the Israelites had to go uh, to be in front of uh, the to to do a pilgrimage, so to speak, to uh, into Jerusalem, and for a particular particular feasts, three feasts specifically. So the ones that there were appointed times for them to be there were the feast of the Passover or the unleavened bread, the feast of weeks, also known as Pentecost, and the feast of booths, which is like a reaping uh, celebration. Um, and uh, so let's look a little bit at each one of them. Pentecost, uh, for example, but we will look at them first in Exodus 23, verses 14 to 17. So we can see how that was the directive that they had. So here we go. Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib, for in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. So we see this is celebration, the Passover, uh, the passing over and the savings of the firstborn before they were let out of Egypt. And the feast of harvest, the first fruit of your labors, which you have sown in the field, and the feast, and that is also known as Pentecost, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you have gathered in the fruits of your labor from the field. Three times in the year all your males shall appear before the Lord God. Because we are looking at this and we're seeing Jesus has appeared. So we're looking back to see what the Israelites had to do and how Jesus prepared them for this uh, event. Deuteronomy 16.16, 16, also a little more short, but... Similarly, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, God chooses, at the feast of the unleavened bread, at the feast of weeks, and the feast of tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Now, very interesting as we are looking at them, one of the things that I didn't realize till I started this lesson is that these feasts were also prophetic. And the amazing thing is how Jesus fulfilled them, uh, at least the first two, and how he will be fulfilling the third one. So let's look at that and how they compare and how Jesus fulfilled them right on time. And that's really the um, uh, amazing thing. Now, before we look at that, I want to look at Hebrews 9.23 because we want to know why is Jesus going, as verse 24 told us, in front of God? Um, and what it is, why is he in heaven? So here it is. It says in verse 23, which is right before our text for the day, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So, Basically, the feasts were appointed before for the earthly uh, sanctuary and for the celebrations that the Israelites are doing. But those were not sufficient. A better sacrifice was needed, and that was Jesus' blood. But let's see how Jesus fulfilled them. Uh, Matthew 27, 45, 46. Now, it, it's, it talks about uh, Jesus' death, and let's read it together, and then we'll review it. Now, for the sixth hour, until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. Jesus is on the cross at this time. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, sabachthani, elama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? 
what we want to look at is that he died about the ninth hour. That's really when he、um, cried out and died. That was the time of the sacrificial time for the Passover lamb. So that he fulfilled like on the dot, amazingly. And then going on from there,、um, Jesus was also resurrected. We know on the third day and ascended to heaven to receive assurance from God the Father that his sacrifice had been accepted. And we know that he, once he was resurrected, he didn't ascend immediately because we have John 20:17 that tells us. Jesus said to Mary. So here he is. He's meeting Mary after he has been resurrected, and she. He says to her, "Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, 'I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God.'" So we know that immediately he told her, "Hold back! Don't hold on to me. I do have to ascend to the Father." And then he returns. We know that he spends from the Bible text forty days with the disciples, and after that he ascends. So let's look at also at First Corinthians fifteen twenty. We know that, but not, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So the interesting connection to that is, as he's ascending to the Father, this is an indicator test text for us. So we know that he is looking to be accepted by the Father, that his sacrifice has been accepted. And why do we know that? It's because. How it was done in Leviticus 23:10, 12. How was this festival done? So I'm going to read it, and then we'll notice the last verse. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. So they would take the first sheaf. Of their harvest, not the entire harvest, just the first sheaf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it, and you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burned offering to the Lord. So it's like here's the harvest; it's acceptable, and here's the connection to the lamb. It's like God couldn't have done it more pointed of a lesson to them than that.、Um, so we can see how this. Was also fulfilled right on the dot, and then continuing, the purpose of this pilgrimage in the ancient times was to behold the face of God. Like when they were going these three times、uh, to Jerusalem, was to meet God face to face. In other words, they were coming and they were paying homage to Him. They were sacrificing, confessing their sins, and they were. Looking for his acceptance, so let's look together at Psalm seventeen fifteen, which confirms that.、Uh, As for me, I'll be vindicated and will see your face. When I wake up, I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. So it's like seeing the face of God,、uh, getting their、uh, his acceptance. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sins and will heal their land. So we can see that there was another reason to to go to see God is to ask、uh, and re- request the things that you needed. So, like if you needed healing and、um, if you had any.、Um, Major problem, you would seek God's face. So that would be also the times that they would go. Those three times, it would be another opportunity for them to do that. Now Jesus,、um, we can see how he fulfilled those first two, right on time. And the Pentecost, really interesting. We know that、uh, he sent. He told them that he would send the Holy Spirit. We read the text before. And the interesting thing is that Pentecost, the word Pentecost stands for fiftieth. I didn't know that. And we know that he ascended after forty days, and not long after, the Holy Spirit was sent in the form of the when the Holy Spirit presence was felt at the Pentecost, with the three thousand believers getting baptized. So even that was fulfilled right on time. 
But why did Jesus go in front of the Father? In Hebrews 6, 19, 20, it says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. He's a forerunner. He is a forerunner, and he's gone ahead to open and prepare the way for us. We are to follow. A forerunner is followed by us. So I'm going to close reading Hebrews 11, 10, 16. And let's listen to these words carefully. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past child childbearing age, was in enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he, has, uh, he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as uncountless as the sand on the she seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died, and so will those that have gone before us. They're, they were living by faith. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. And so are we. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. And so are we. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Thank you, Danielle. Scott. <clears throat> You're going to do God's invitation. God's invitation, yes. Um, so God's invitation, it, it, um, it's based on Hebrews 12, 18 through 21, so we'll start with that. Um, for you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, that burned with fire, to the blackness and dark, uh, darkness tempest, and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure what was commanded, and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. So I was trying to think of an example of something grand we might see. So I, I, I remember as a teen, the first time I went to the Grand Canyon, I was just awe-stricken, just going, this is amazing. Um, and again, I felt the same way when I first saw the giant sequoias or the Amazon River. Um, but... I think being there in the presence of God next to that mountain when God's presence actually descended and shook the mountain with his voice must have been uh, both awe-inspiring and terrifying. And yet, um, I think the people would have benefited had they stayed there. So um, I'm also reminded, and now I'm going to go off a little bit in a different direction than what I'd written in these verses here, but I'm also reminded of the parable of the dinner that Christ told that's found in Luke 14:16 and he said a man was giving a big dinner and he invited many and at the dinner hour he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited come for everything is ready but they all alike began to make excuses um, and then the first one said I bought a piece of land and so on uh, but then the, the part at the end is it says, go out at once. So he told the servants after the invited guests, go out into the streets and lanes of the city and bring here the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Um, and he said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And says, go to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. So um, the, the point here is that if we don't accept... God's invitation when he's inviting us to come in he's going to send it to other people even if it has to be to homeless people on the corner um, so now continuing on it says when God called the Israelites from Egypt his plan was to create a personal intimate relationship with them and he said 
You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Thus, through Moses, God gave the necessary instructions to prepare the people to meet with him. Those who ascended to the foot of the mountain without preparation would die. Nevertheless, once the people had prepared themselves for two days, and when the trumpet sounded with a long blast on the third day, God instructed the people they should come up to the mountain. That was in Exodus 19.13. So now let's read a little bit from Exodus um, so I'll read from verses 10 to 15. Um, then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take, take heed uh, yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast. He shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, then they shall come near the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain and the people, uh, to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. All right, so um, continuing on here, he wanted them to have the experience that Moses and the leaders of the people um, would have when they ascended the mountain, of, uh, mountain and beheld God and ate and drank in his presence. The people later recognized that God's glory and that it was possible for God to speak with man and still live. But when the moment came, they lacked the faith. Moses explained years later, you were afraid because of the fire and you did not go up into the mountain. Instead, they asked Moses to be their intermediary. Um, so what, what came to mind here is that um, although it's terrifying being in that experience of directly listening to God, that it would have served a good purpose and that the people might not have rebelled and sinned against God by worshiping a golden calf a short time after this experience. So the lesson for us today is that we need to first cleanse ourselves by putting away of sin, and after that, the dwelling in the presence of the Lord will be a blessing to us, while it is a consuming fire to those who cling to their sins. We do not literally worship a golden calf today, but the spirit of prophecy says that men can as easily make an idol of their theories as did the ancients make idols of wood and stone. Now, and here's some examples that I thought of idolatrous theories today. For example, uh, the theory of evolution that is replacing God with random chance. Higher criticism, the Bible cannot be taken as reliable, but we should trust in learned men that can put it in context. The papacy, where they're placing a man as a mediator between man and Christ when the the Bible says that Jesus is the only mediator. Ecumenism, putting aside the truth of God in favor of popular errors which agree uh, with the beliefs of the majority. The false Sabbath, that is worshiping God on the venerable day of the sun instead of the seventh day. Counterfeit justification, since it is impossible for you to keep the law of God in your own strength, that a lot of the churches say you don't even have to try. God will just forgive you, so you don't have to produce the fruits. The immortality of the soul. That is the belief that you go directly to heaven or hell at death rather than sleeping until judgment day when God will bring his reward with him. So there are some examples of modern idols that can keep people from accepting God's invitation to become partakers with him. So God's manifestation of his holiness at Mount Sinai was to teach the people to learn fear, that is respect. Fear the Lord leads to life, wisdom, and honor, and also to the lesson that he is merciful and gracious. Thus, while God wanted Israel to come to him, people became afraid and requested that Moses be their intermediary. Um, the description of Hebrews, that, of the events that follow at Sinai, um, Moses primarily <coughs> uh, 
reminded the people of their lack of faith and their apostasy with the golden half was uh, how he was a and how he was afraid of meeting God because of their sin. The people's reaction was not God's plan for them. Instead, it was the result of faithlessness. Um, so we'll, we'll end with reading a couple of um, the verses from, that were quoted here. Um, so Deuteronomy 4.10 says, especially concerning the day that you stood before the Lord God in Horeb, when the Lord said, gather the people to me and I will let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on earth. And then Psalms 111.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and a good understanding have all those who do his commandments. And then from Proverbs 1 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Um, so we'll, we'll end with that, uh, remembering that if we accept God's invitation, we must do so with trembling and trepidation, but yet not be so afraid that we don't actually accept his invitation. So we, we must accept the invitation, even though it's scary to us. So we'll, we'll go on to Tuesday. The need for a veil. Now, this, this whole concept of a veil is, is, um, <clears throat> is interesting because it, in Hebrews, we see the term veil as catapetismo. It's kind of a hard word to say, which, could re which refers to the screen of the court. And if we look at the different screens or the different veils, <laughs> um, that we had in the ceremony services. The first one uh, that we see, Acts 38:18, is the screen to, for the gate of the court. It was woven in blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine wo woven linen. Its length was two cubits and the height was five cubits, corresponding with the hangings of the court. So uh, five cubits is about, um, uh, probably about nine, nine feet, I think, is if, if, if my calculations are correct. So it was, a, it was a large curtain. It was a long curtain. It was a wide curtain. And we see that the, the colors woven in, the blue, which was the, the, the sacredness that the priests wore. Remember, the, the priests had blue in their garments. Purple, which is royalty and then scarlet of sacrifice. So we see <clears throat> that there's meaning in these veils as well, that, that, there's, that it represents Christ. It, it all represents Christ, actually. So this was the screen <clears throat> to the outer apartment of the sanctuary. Also, the screen at the for the temple door was made of blue, purple, scarlet, same colors, and fine wo woven linen. And then there was the inner veil into the most holy place, into the holy of holies. And that's in Exodus 26, 31 to 35. It says, you will make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet, the same colors, representing royalty and the sacredness and, and sacrifice of fine woven linen. It is to be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. Now we remember behind the Holy of Holies was what? The mercy seat. And it was guarded by the cherubim. And so cherubim then was woven into the, the, the curtain, the veil that was between. Uh, you should hang it on four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon four sockets of silver and you shall hang the veil from the drapes. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider between you and the holy place and the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testament in the most holy. You shall set the table outside the veil, the lamp stand across from the table, on the side of the tabernacle of the south, and you shall put the table on the side, on the north side. So we see that <clears throat> God had veils between 
the compartments. And between the compartments, different, different um, phases of the services took place between these veils. We see the outer court where the sacrifices were, the blood that went into the holy, and then on the Day of Atonement was the only time they entered the Holy of Holies. So each, each veil separated a sacred piece of the service. Can I make a quick comment on that? Sure. So what, one thought that just came to me with regards to the colors was that um, the blue represents God's law and the red represents his mercy. Mm -hmm. And together they're blended into Christ's royalty, the purple. So mm -hmm. I, I just, that, that thought occurred to me. It's beautiful, isn't it? We also know that it was, this, this was all very sacred. And we see in Leviticus 16, and I'm not going to read these verses for sake of time, but we see in Leviticus 16, 1 and 2, and Leviticus 10, 1, 2, 3, what happened when someone went into the sanctuary and did not follow, but would took in strange fire or misbehaved. And we see that with Nahab, Nahab and Abihu. And they were struck down. Um, because the, of, of this disrespect for the veil. So we see the veil being a protection for the priests as they ministered in the, in the places, but it also, it also divided um, the services. And we remember after the sin of the golden calf, God had said, um, <clears throat> I'm not going with you into the, the Holy Land. And God actually, or Moses actually took uh, and pitched his tent outside the camp, far from, um, and, ca and called its tabernacle of meeting. And it, be it came to pass that after everyone who sought the Lord went up to the tabernacle of meeting that was outside the camp, God came in and said, okay, I will go with you. In fact, we see that in Exodus 33, 12 through 20. But I'm going to read 13 and 14 right now. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know it and find grace in your sight and consider the nation as a people. And he said, God said to them, my presence will go with you. So we see that, that God had his challenges with his people. And so the veil protected also the priests, then, as they, they did their services. Um, um, and he, he, he established measures to protect the people as they dwelt among them. For instance, there's another kind of veil that was set up, um, and that was around the camp, of Israel, uh, the camp of Israel itself. And it was the way it was created. If you look at a, a a plot of the, the children of Israel in the desert, you will see them set around in camps. And in the center of the camp, it's like a big square kind of, and in the center is the temple. And around the temple you see uh, four uh, of the, the, the tribes of Levi around the temple, Moses and the priests, and then you would have, you had uh, three others there that literally was the inner guard for the, for the temple. And then you see outside of that, around the 12 tribes set up so that in the heart, the heart of everything that they did was, <clears throat> was the tabernacle. Um, and when they moved, it was the, it was the Levites who took it down and set it up. And Numbers 3.10 says, so you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to the priests. On the out, but the outsider who comes in shall be put to death. So we saw that that happen. So I want to finish up here by reading to you from Ministry of Healing. In the sanctuary of the wilderness tabernacle and of the temple, that were in the earthly symbols of God's dwelling place, one apartment was sacred to his presence. The veil, inwrought with cherubim at its interest, was not to be lifted by 
any hand save one to lift the veil an intruder forbidden uh, uh, intrude and unbidden into the sacred mystery of the most holy place was death for above the mercy seat dwelt the holiest glory upon which no man might look and live on the day of the year appointed for ministry in the most holy place the high priest with trembling entered God's presence while clouds of incense veiled the glory from his sight throughout the courts of the temple every sound was hushed no priest ministered at the altars the host of worshipers bowed in silent awe offered their petitions to God so the veils not only protected the priests but it also protected the people from the brightness of the glory of God and now Danielle you what are you going to tell we're us moving about? on to Wednesday yes. Wednesday the new and living way through the veil <clears throat> we're going to talk about the veil some more yep but it's an interesting aspect it's an aspect that I've never really noticed or paid much attention to so let's review the text together Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 to 22 uh, we're going to read first and then we're going to unpack it a little bit therefore brethren having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh the veil his flesh mm. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What is all that? Let's review a little bit. So therefore, brethren, that be us, having boldness. Now the word boldness here, I was looking it back in Greek and it said parousia it has the meaning with outspokenness frankness so we are to come with frankness plainness of speech courage confidence and fearlessness that's how we are to enter the holiest now if you told an Israelite to enter the holiest in the past they would never because they'd be dead so we are invited to enter the holiest in that now when we enter um, that's another very interesting concept we don't think much of the word enter is such a simple word but really it means we cannot stand back at a distance we are to enter because that's the only way we could be in a direct relationship with God he's calling us to enter with boldness so come close and we are to enter the holiest we already know a lot about the holiest we've been studying about it and how that is the throne of God the government of God the place God is so we are to enter where God is that way his government and how by the blood of Jesus in the end of verse 19 now that's compared to when they were coming to the temple first of all they didn't enter the holiest of holiest but when they came they came by the blood of sacrificial left of dead animals we are coming through the live blood of Jesus um, and he is an effective once for all sacrifice we are not coming like they did three times a year you know with sacrifices and so on and so forth repeated through the year uh, and we are by a new and living way it has new because it now the the concept is that it's new because it didn't exist before before Christ really gave up his life for us it didn't exist uh, and a living way rather than a dead sacrifice uh, like a lamb because he is alive and he has been resurrected and he's alive continuing his work for us in heaven uh, consecrating so in a living way which he consecrated for us now the word consecrate I was trying to understand what they're trying to say there it's ekainizio in Greek sorry if I butchered it but it means to dedicate and it also means inaugurate 
And that started making sense to me because it was inaugurated by his sacrifice. It's like it, it was not in existence before. This access for us directly into the place of the throne of God, it was inaugurated specifically for us. And through the veil, and that's, we know what the veil stands for. Uh, it generally understood to means the entrance or the doorway and things like that. But how we compare this veil, it says through the veil that is his flesh. How is that? And I had to do some research to figure out how, they, how can that be. And it's really pointing back to the humanity of Jesus because Jesus paid that sacrifice and opened that way by coming to this earth and taking our place in a human flesh. He took our place. So this veil of access to the throne of God was provided through his coming to earth and dying for us in human flesh. So that was actually, I thought, how appropriate that they said it that way. I would have never understood it, never noticed it unless they said it that way. And then having a high priest over the house of God now that's the theme of Hebrews. That's why we've been studying the entire quarter that the, the house of God and Jesus being the high priest uh, and us being prepared to be a nation of priests. It says, let us draw near with a true heart. We are to draw near. Why are we to draw near? Because if we stay at a distance, we cannot become part of it. We are to approach God and accept them. And with a true heart is because we are to set our desires and our biases aside and come with a true heart for God in full assurance of faith. And how can we do that? Only in faith. And it's like when we're looking at a full assurance, it's in an unswerving faith in the fact that Christ's blood can atone for us and pay our sacrifice. And having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience now, it was very interesting that when we're looking at um, the sacrifices in the Old Testament, they were sprinkling all the time, and it, it was symbolic. And that was the way the Old Covenant was ratified when they first uh, set it up. But Jesus, with his blood, also ratified the New Covenant with us, this new agreement with us. And from our evil consciences, that's our past. That's who we were before God. Nothing good was in us, as the Bible tells us. All good comes from God. So we are to live our past behind our evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. We are to allow God to take over and wash us in, in our entirety, sort of like a baptism. When we die, our old man dies, and the new one, living in Christ living in us, comes to fruition. And pure water because that's the most appropriate symbol of cleansing that we have for God to convey to us. So we can see what an amazing text that is. This is basically the summation of it, but there's a few things that are kind of hidden that we're looking at in, in this part of the lesson through the veil. Um, that, so I like to look back at Hebrews 9.24 uh, that we reviewed last Sunday. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So again, when Jesus is, when we're looking at this Hebrews 10, 9, 20, 19 to 22, it's, even though the symbols are very clear of the Old Testament, everything is a reference of what Jesus has begun to do for us, and he's providing access to us to the heavenly sanctuary, not the earthly sanctuary. So that's where we're looking forward to. And he is a forerunner and a captain. I'm going to review one text. We already looked at a forerunner text last Sunday. But let's look together at Hebrews 2.10. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now what happens to a captain? We follow, like we are the team, we're to follow the captain. A um, couple things that I wanted to really skip to and underline. Um, 
Good news that are brought to us is that a new era was opened by Jesus' sacrifice for the people of God. Satan was thrown out of heaven. And we'll just spend a couple of moments looking at that. In Zechariah 3, 1 to 2, we know that Satan was, when Job was being attacked, Satan was there contending with him, with the Lord, for him, with the Lord, wanting Job. And then in Zechariah, we also look at Joshua. It says, Zechariah 3, 1 to 2. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan, standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord, re Lord rebuke you, Satan. So we see here that there was a contention, like there was a presence in heaven of, during the time of Joshua, and it's Satan arguing with God over Joshua. But we look at a text that Jesus told us in John 12, 29 to 31 at his baptism. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice is not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And in John verse 8, after he, like at the time of his ascension, Jesus is saying about the Holy Spirit. And when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin. Because they do not believe in me, of also he will convict of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And he will convict of judgment, the Holy Spirit will, because the ruler of this world is judged. So the good news to us is that with Jesus' sacrifice, Jesus, I mean, Satan was cast out of heaven. Thank you. Scott. Talk to us about they will see his face. They will see his face. I so, hope we are the they. Yes, I, I hope <laughs> it's that we will see his face. <laughs> That's right. So in, in this <laughs> section, I think this is the, the glorious conclusion of the three veils. Um, this one, if we follow the typology they've been talking about, the first two pilgrimages uh, of, of Israel where the Passover and the Pentecost were fulfilled at Christ's death and resurrection, and the second one, the Pentecost, was fulfilled at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit 50 days after Christ's ascension. Um, however, the fulfillment of the Feast of Booths is yet future, and will occur when the New Jerusalem is brought down for heaven, from heaven. Instead of the perishable booths made by man out of tree branches, the New Jerusalem will be made out of uh, transparent gold made by God himself, uh, full of precious stone and everything amazing. So um, let's go through some of these verses a little bit. So Hebrews um, 22 through 29, I'm going to read that. Um, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men uh, made perfect, to Jesus the mediator, and of that new covenant and the blood sprinkling that speaks of better things than that of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. So as we remember, there was an example of the people of Israel refusing to listen to God and instead saying, let Moses listen to him and give us the summary. Um, for they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth. Much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice shook the earth, but now as he has promised, saying, yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Yet this once more indicates a removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, things th um, that which we cannot be shaken, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom uh, which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably 
with the reverence of godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. So now we'll, we'll um, unpack this. Uh, so this grace that we might have is represented by the garment in Christ's parable that the guests were to wear to the wedding feast. So we must wear Christ's garment, which is his righteousness, and thus we may boldly approach the throne of grace. Otherwise, we're going to be consumed. So, and, and there's some verses to, to show this. So in Ephesians 2.5, it says, Even when we were dead in trespasses, made alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And then in Colossians 3.1, it says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Um, while true, this is not the whole meaning. Oh, we also have arrived at Mount Zion in the very presence of God. Jesus' ascension is not a matter of faith, but a fact. This historical dimension of Jesus' ascension that provides compelling force to the exhortation of Hebrews to hold on to our confession that's in Hebrews 4.14. And let's, let's read that. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but who was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. Um, so, let's see, um, going on, God's, pur God's purpose will be fulfilled not only in Jesus, um, however, but also in us. We have said that Jesus' ascension fulfilled the typology, um, where am I doing? the typology of the first two yearly pilgrimage in Israel, that is the Passover and Pentecost. According to Hebrews, the book of, and the book of Re Revelation, the last pilgrimage, the Feast of Booths, is yet to be fulfilled. We will celebrate it with Jesus when we are in the city, whose architect and builder is God. In the heavenly homeland, uh, we will not build booths, but God's booth or tent will descend from heaven, and we will live with him forever. Um, so I wanted to... I'll read a passage now from Great Controversy, which I think um, it really impressed me as kind of giving um, some sort of a semblance of the of the grandness of the how amazing it's going to be to be there when when God actually shows up and we actually will uh, be able to experience the city of the New Jerusalem. It is at midnight that God manifests his power for the deliverance of his people. The sun appears, shining in its strength. Signs and wonder follow in quick succession. The wicked look in terror and amazement upon the scene, while the righteous behold it with solemn joy, the tokens of their deliverance. Everything in nature seems to be turned out of its course. The seams, streams cease to flow. Dark, heavy clouds come up and clash against each other. In the midst of the angry heavens, there is one clear space of indescribable glory whence comes the voice of God like the sound of many waters. It is done. The voice shakes the heavens and the earth, and there is a mighty earthquake such as, ne uh, such as was not since the men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. So this is reminiscent of what happened at Mount Sinai only times 1,000. Um, the firmament appears to open and shut. The glory of God, uh, the, go the glory from the throne of God seems to be flashing through. The mountains shake like a reed in the wind and the ragged rocks are scattered on every side. There is a roar of a coming tempest. The sea is lashed into fury. There is heard the shriek of a hurricane like the voice of demons upon a mission of destruction. The whole earth heaves and swells like the waves of the sea. The surface is breaking up. Its very foundations seem to be giving way. Mountain chains are sinking. Inhabited islands disappear. 
the seaports that have become like Sodom for wickedness are swallowed up by the angry waters. Babylon the great has come in remembrance before God to give her unto the cup of wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Great hailstones about the weight of a talent are doing their work of destruction. The proudest cities of the earth are laid low. The lordly palace is upon which the world's great men have lavished their wealth in order to glorify themselves are crumbling in ruin before their eyes. Prison walls are rent asunder and God's people that have been held in bondage for their faiths are set free. Graves are opened and many that sleep in the dust shall awake to some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. All who have died in the faith of the third angel's message come forth from the tomb glorified to hear God's covenant of peace with those who have kept his law. They also which pierced him and that mocked and derided Christ dying and the most violent opposers of his truth are raised to behold him in his glory. And to see the honor placed upon the loyal and obedient. Uh, obedient. Um, a thick cloud still cover the sky, yet the sun now and then breaks through, appearing like the avenging eye of Jehovah. Fierce lightnings leap from heavens, enveloping uh, the earth in a sheet of flame. Above the terrific roar of thunders, voices mysterious and awful declare the doom of the wicked. The words spoken are not comprehended by all, but they are distinctly understood by the false teachers. Those who a little while were so reckless, so boastful, so defiant, so exultant in their cruelty to God's commandment keeping people, are now overwhelmed with consternation and shuddering with fear. Their wails are heard above the sounds of the elements. Demons acknowledge the deity of Christ and tremble before his power while men are supplicating for mercy and groveling in abject terror, says the prophet of old. They beheld in holy vision the day of God. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust for the fear of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and idols of gold, that they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, and go into the clefts of the rock and into the tops of the ragged rock for the fear of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shape terribly the earth. That was a quote from Isaiah, the last one. So anyway, I'm ending with that, which is like a grand picture of how that scene on Mount Sinai when God gave the law will be um, reenacted um, in an amazingly grand format. And that will be the beginning of the Feast of Booths. Booths. Good. It won't be quiet either, it sounds like. Danielle. So my final <laughs> comment is sort of thinking along the same idea on the festival of, there's one festival left, and that is when we're going to be with the Lord, and we're going, he's invited us to step. He's opened the way with his sacrifice. He was the veil, the flesh veil that opened the way for us to go in front of God and have access and to his presence and be with the Lord forever and our loved ones. It's just incredible. Yes. Um, I was thinking about seeing beyond the veil. Um, if we look at the veils and how they protected the services and how they protected um, us as, as regular God-loving people from the, the glory of his presence because it's too strong for us because we're so sinful. There's two times we see this um, um, being able to see into the most holy place. One was when the sacrificial system ended, when Christ died. And the next time we see it in heaven is when the end is near and the judgment is taking place. And so we are in that time. And this is a, this is a study that's very important. If you look at Christ in his sanctuary, it says the pioneers of the movement saw the sanctuary truth as basic to the whole structure 
of the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine and that the subject of the sanctuary should be carefully examined as it lies the foundation of our faith and hope. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for this wonderful study that we've had about looking beyond the veils, about seeing the veils in the different um, um, services that take place. We look forward, Lord, to that Feast of Booths that's soon to come. And as we see the day approaching, Lord, we just pray that you would be with each of us, that you would strengthen our hearts and our minds for you, and that as um, we go through our day, that you are in the forefront of our minds. So thank you for being with us. We want to thank you for this wonderful Sabbath that we're having, and just pray that as we continue on through this day, that you will walk with us, that you will walk through us to the end of our days, and that we will be able to see the joy of your coming and the joy of seeing you face to face. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Have a great Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.